Perfect. Okay, good morning, everybody. And thank you, Dr. Adashi, for being here. Um, it's our uh, custom here in California to shout out and bring up minorities who maybe are not, don't have the capability of getting IVF or getting their reproductive rights respected. Uh, and that's what I wanted to say before we have this amazing talk. Um, it's not often that I get to introduce a member of the National Academy of Medicine, and you'll have to forgive me if I don't do a good job. I went over the summary of Dr. Adashi's um, resume, not, not the resume itself, just the summary. And I try to summarize the summary. So I highlighted the things that most impressed me. Uh, other than the National Academy of Medicine that blew me away, he's also a member of the New York Academy of Sciences, a fellow of the Royal College of OBGYN. He's the doctor honoris causa in Poland, in Canada, in Jinan, China, in Shanghai, China, et cetera, et cetera. Um, he was the former Dean of Medicine uh, at Brown University. And he started in Tel Aviv University School of Medicine. He was probably one of the first graduates there. From there, he uh, went to directly to Harvard, uh, to a public health program and had a master in public health. Um, and then his residency was at Taft University. From there, he went directly to work with the popes of reproductive medicine in the US, uh, Georgiana and Cedar Jones. And it seems that they like him uh, because <laughs> uh, they were really nice people, you see, but they had to like it, like you. Um, let's see where he went from there. It looks like he went far away uh, to San Diego, where he also worked under uh, Dr. Samuel Yen. I know Dr. Yen from a book that he wrote that to me was the Bible. I kept it under my pillow for many years. Um, and then I highlighted that he mentored over 50 postdoctoral trainees. Uh, he authored close to 600 peer-reviewed papers and wrote more than 125 book chapters and reviews. Um, he also got involved uh, with uh, the NIH. He got funding from 1985 to 2005, and he got a Research Career Development Award. And there is more and more and more, and I'm not going to go over that because I want you to enjoy every minute of Dr. Arashi's presentation. So I'm going to leave him with you. And again, welcome to joining from those heights, a simple county hospital in California. That's very nice of you. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Liliana. I appreciate it. Um, Perhaps I can um, start with two qualifiers. My guess is that our time may not allow us to discuss at length the future of IVF. And so we will emphasize today mostly the past of IVF in the United States, of course, uh, which is the focus of our discussion. Um, all of you, of course, recognize that IVF was originally started in the United Kingdom, and we were really in a catch-up mode, and were only able to accomplish this feat in 1981, which would be three years after Robert Edwards 
and Dr. Steptoe established IVF in the UK. The perhaps the um, other qualifier I will um, place here is that uh, we will have to probably uh, focus on that part of the conversation. This uh, slide suggests that it's been 40 years since IVF came to the United States, but in reality, it's now been 42 years. Uh, it happened in 1981, and so it's been, uh, you know, significant time since then. What we're celebrating today or re-recognizing today is the birth of Elizabeth Jordan Carr, who was the first IVF baby in the United States. She was displayed, needless to say, on virtually any media outlet in the United States, from the Boston Globe to Life Magazine and many others. This was big news at the time, and those of you who were old enough to watch national news may recall that this was featured in the evening national news back in 1981, uh, which uh, was truly noted throughout the nation. In truth, however, there is some evidence to suggest that the story of IVF, including in the United States, really dates back to 1965. And what I mean by that is that in 1965, a young Bob Edwards uh, came from the United Kingdom to the United States, specifically to Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, to join Drs. Howard and Georgiana Jones, who are displayed in this uh, photograph, and to work with them for one year, with the goal being the collection and characterization of human oocytes. Ideally, the team was hoping to culture those oocytes, mature them, and if at all possible, fertilize them in vitro. The source of the oocytes was going to be resected ovarian wedges from polycystic ovary patients who underwent ovarian wedge resection, which Dr. Howard Jones used to perform quite regularly. It turns out that in the United Kingdom, Professor Edwards was hard pressed to come by human oocytes, which is precisely the reason he came to the United States to work with Howard and Georgiana Jones at the Johns Hopkins uh, Hospital. At the conclusion of that one year effort, the team uh, published a paper in the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, first authored by Dr. Edwards and senior authored by Dr. Howard Jones. You can tell from the title, which reads, Preliminary Attempts to Fertilize Human Oocytes Matured in Vitro, that the team assumed or concluded that they actually failed to fertilize human oocytes matured in vitro. They attempted to do so, but it was their conclusion that they did not succeed. A retrospective review of some of the photographs that are shown in the paper suggests to some of us today 
that the conclusions drawn by the authors at the time may have been too pessimistic and that they may in fact have been successful in fertilizing these human oocytes that were matured in vitro. If that is in fact the case, and we may never truly know the full facts of the story, then you could say that at least the preclinical component of IVF dates back to 1965 or 1966, and specifically to the United States rather than to the United Kingdom. But of course, we, that is a revised form of history that cannot be fully backed up. And so we have to go with what we know. And that is, of course, that 12 years later, in 1978, uh, Professor Edwards um, and his collaborators were able to finally achieve a human pregnancy following the in vitro fertilization of a human oocyte. But back to our American story, it was July 1, 1978, when Howard and Georgiana Jones concluded what amounted to 35 years of service at the Johns Hopkins Hospital and decided to quote unquote, retire. And so that was the end of a chapter and in principle, the beginning of a new one. So it was goodbye Hopkins and hello Norfolk, which is where they were heading in part because the chair of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology in Norfolk, that was Eastern Virginia Medical School, was an old acquaintance from Baltimore and one that they felt they could comfortably, comfortably work with. And so while superficially viewed, one has to wonder why they aimed at Norfolk, there was a very sound reason for that. However, something happened on the way to Norfolk. And that something happened on July the 25th, 1978. And that of course was the birth of Louise Joy Brown, the very first IVF baby, who is shown here in the arms of her mother, Leslie, who has since sadly passed away. I'm not sure we can get. And then we oh. came to Norfolk. Okay, there we go. And that happened to be the birthday of Louise Brown. The story captured the world's headlines, and the Joneses had a link with the British team of Patrick Stepto and Robert Edwards. Edwards had worked with them at Baltimore. A Norfolk reporter wanted to talk about it. She came to our home as the man was moving in the boxes and the furniture, and we had an interview uh, sitting on the boxes. And uh, as she finished the interview, she asked us, uh, well, uh, could this be done in Norfolk? And we thought it was uh, almost a joke. And we said, why, certainly. And she said, uh, what would it take? And we said, a little money. What happened? A most extraordinary thing. Uh, Georgiana had had a patient from Norfolk who um, had come to Baltimore with infertility. Uh, she was. Uh, fortunate to have a child subsequent to that. And she called up Georgiana. She said, uh, Dr. Jones, I understand that Dr. Howard says that it will only take a little bit of money to bring a test tube baby clinic to Norfolk. And my family has a foundation 
which we would love to donate. So with the resources having been addressed, if you will, uh, step one was the establishment of a team, which is shown here and upon which I will elaborate some. First, a note will be made of Dr. Mason Andrews, who, as I mentioned earlier, was an acquaintance of the Joneses, who trained at Johns Hopkins and uh, was an obstetrician gynecologist. At that point, the chair of the department at the Eastern Virginia Medical School in Norfolk. He was destined to be the obstetrician who would deliver the first IVF baby, which we will all witness before too long. Another important member of the team was Professor Jairo Garcia, who was a former trainee of Howard and Georgiana Jones and who joined the team from Colombia, South America. Howard Jones uh, Jr. himself, of course, his wife, Georgiana Seeger Jones, and Professor Anibal Acosta, mostly a male reproductive biologist, but uh, an obstetrician gynecologist, also a former trainee of Howard and Georgiana Jones, who joined in this case, the team from Argentina. Last but hardly least was Ms. Lucinda Wieck, who was to serve as the embryologists of the team. With the team assembled, the next challenge was securing what is known as a certificate of need or CON, which still exists for some facilities around the country, but at the time in all likelihood was ubiquitous. This, however, ended up presenting a problem. In the process of trying to secure a certificate of need, a battle royale ensued between the pro-life and pro-choice constituencies of the state of Virginia. The pro-life constituency was led by Charles Dean Jr., who was the president of the Tidewater chapter of the Virginia Society for Human Life. On the pro-choice side of the equation were several individuals who were called in by the Joneses. Uh, leading this pack was Roy Parker, MD, then chair of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Duke University School of Medicine, who was also contempor contemporaneously at the same time, the president of ACOG. They also called in Professor John D. Biggers from Harvard Medical School, a scientist who was to support the position of the Joneses. Also on the pro-choice side was the Right Reverend Heath Light, and Rabbi Lawrence Foreman. At the end of the day, and I am definitely taking a shortcut here, a certificate of need was ultimately granted, but not without a significant debate that left a somewhat bitter taste and cannot be dismissed as such. But that permitted the Joneses to begin the program. In other words, to bring in patients, stimulate the uh, women in question with gonadotropins, 
retrieve or sites and go from there. The early record was one during which 41 couples went through what was then known a natural IVF cycle with embryo transfer. That is to say, no gonadotropins were administered to stimulate the production of oocytes so as to increase the number of oocytes. Instead, only one or two oocytes at most were aspirated uh, at mid-cycle, fertilized and transferred in the hope of achieving a pregnancy. However, these natural IVF cycles did not yield a single pregnancy. At that point, mostly following the example of the IVF team in the United Kingdom and the recommendation of Dr. Georgiana Jones, the team abandoned the idea of natural IVF cycles and proceeded to stimulate the women who are going through IVF with human menopausal gonadotropins, HMG, and then retrieve a more substantial number of oocytes, fertilize those, select the presumptive best embryos, and transfer one of those back. There were 12 such cycles on top of the 41 unstimulated cycles. In other words, a total of 53 cycles, which yielded not a single pregnancy. So at this point in the history of the program, it was somewhat discouraging in that 53 attempts were undertaken, but no pregnancies ensued. Enter Judith and Roger Carr, the couple that was eventually destined to be blessed with a pregnancy and which constituted the very first success of this new American IVF program. The egg retrieval in the case of Judy Carr transpired on April the 21st, 1981, and the embryo transfer uh, took place six days later on April the 27th, 1981. The pregnancy test turned positive to everybody's delight on May the 7th, 1981, and plans were made for delivery by cesarean section in this case of the baby who was tentatively known even then as Elizabeth Jordan Carr. And indeed, on December the 28th, 1981, a cesarean section was performed and Elizabeth Carr was born. I hope that the video, which I mean to show you, will perform. Um, let's give it a try. Elizabeth Jordan Carr. <laughs> You, 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 that's all I want to say. No, I like the hat. <laughs> Thank you. You're a Well, you don't look too thrilled when I like that. <laughs> She is kind of tiny, though, isn't she? She looks well nourished. You can tell by the uh, the skin, the quality of the skin, and the uh, <laughs> thickness of the skin folds. 
We'll, we'll, we'll let her go back to sleep. <laughs> I think so. Oh, dear. <laughs> so there you have it. Uh, Elizabeth Jordan Carr it was born by a cesarean section and now 42 years ago. The Joneses, um, in their jovial mood, um, decided to name Elizabeth Jordan Carr or to tag her as their first IVF granddaughter. So uh, um, they now had obviously a few grandchildren of their own, but uh, they began to add IVF granddaughters uh, and others, obviously, to their uh, list of achievements. I had the opportunity to speak to Judy Carr on August the 11, 2021, uh, with an eye towards recapturing some of the memories as viewed by her, looking back at uh, a day which was at that point 40 years ago, um, in the hope that that video plays well, um, you will be in a position to hear first place what transpired from the point of view of Judith Carr herself, um, who reflects with the benefit of hindsight on those heady days. It is really good to see you again, Judy, um, and to have this opportunity to revisit what happened now 40 years ago. So thinking back to 1981, what were the circumstances that led you to seek out the Norfolk IVF program? And how did you find out about it in the first place? Well, in 1981, unfortunately, I suffered my third ectopic pregnancy. And after that, I um, was speaking with the doctor and he said, well, I don't know if this makes any sense whatsoever, but he had just returned from a conference in Williamsburg, where he heard both Dr. Jones speak on IVF. And the doctor said to me, I have no idea. I don't understand anything about this, but you might be interested. <laughs> <laughs> Were you aware of the fact at the time that the Norfolk program had yet to give rise to an IVF baby at that time? And if so, would that really have mattered uh, to the extent that you can speculate on that? I had absolutely no idea that they did not have a success. I just assumed that they had, uh, certainly because Louise Brown had been born in England, and I knew there had been some other pregnancies. So I just assumed that this was the, the case for me. When my husband and I discussed it, and we didn't know, and they didn't tell us, um, um, we had decided that we had been given this opportunity to do this as a possibility. And we decided that we didn't want to be 40 years old and looking back and saying, I wish we had done this. And that's, it wouldn't have mattered to us at all. What do you recall? of your first encounter with the Norfolk IVF team. Uh, you, after all, did not know any of the actors, did you? Absolutely not. We were coming from Massachusetts, where this technology was still illegal to even investigate in all of the Massachusetts hospitals. The district attorney in Boston had said this was um, experimentation on an embryo, and that was not allowed. So we headed to Norfolk after having some phone conversations. 
and we walked into the Norfolk Clinic, which was at, at uh, Norfolk Medical School. And the minute I opened the door and walked in, I felt incredibly comfortable and said, we're in the right place. Um, everyone from the reception to Dr. Garcia and the Drs. Jones, Dr. Cost, everyone we met, we knew, um, we felt very, very comfortable. I'm hardly surprised, but uh, <laughs> it's a uh, memory and recollection that only you can share. What is your most vivid recollection of your Norfolk experience, if we can call it that, culminating in the eventual delivery of Elizabeth by cesarean section? Well, I have several vivid uh, memories. Um, all of them were just so wonderful and such a, a joy at the time. But one of the things that I found remarkable, when I became pregnant with Elizabeth, Dr. Howard Jones found out that I was taking the airport limousine to the hotel and to the clinic. And after he found that out, he decided that he would become the new limousine driver. And he picked me up every time I flew into Norfolk for an appointment. And it's during that time that he and I would have conversations that we really got to understand each other. I got to understand the importance of all this, which I really didn't understand before, and more about them and the protocols and all of that. And Dr. Jones got to know more about me. And I thought that was a remarkable experience. The other experience that I obviously cannot forget um, before the birth of Elizabeth was the fact that um, my egg uh, had fertilized and that they were transferring it um, on my birthday on April 17th. <laughs> amazing. <laughs> All kinds of amazing coincidences here with critical dates. Yes. What might you wish to say to the physicians who make up our audience today who are practicing IVF 40 years later as a matter of course, some of whom are probably too young to have uh, recalled what we at least experienced in real time? Well, it's important for doctors to know, and I received this information because I talk to current patients um, often. And one of the things that comes to mind, and I think it's very important for doctors to understand, that each patient, even though there's incredible standard protocols and there's chiropreservation and all these wonderful technologies, the, the doctors do need to not lose sight of each individual patient because there is room for flexibility. And as I said, each patient needs to feel like the doctor knows them. And that's that matter of rapport and trust. And if that doesn't happen, the successes probably aren't as great. Well, very well said. And of course, spoken by somebody who uh, <laughs> has witnessed it all uh, firsthand. Judy, I can't tell you how delighted I am that we had this opportunity, how privileged I feel to have known you and to be in a position to revisit these momentous events. Thank you very much. So that, uh, in a nutshell, is the history of IVF in the United States. Um, I might add a few more points that, uh, in hindsight, could have been added. Um, one uh, sad commentary has to do with the fact that Mr. Carr passed away unexpectedly and definitely too young, um, which is something that happened um, before this interview took place. 
the uh, Joneses, uh, of course, uh, are no longer with us. Um, but in 2010, when the Nobel Prize was awarded to the British team, I had the opportunity to interview Dr. Howard Jones, who at that point was 100 years old, and discuss with him the Nobel Prize award, which he definitely felt very strongly was long overdue and well-deserved. And um, perhaps in hindsight, I should have included that interview. And you can watch it on Medscape if you go online and you'll be able to doubtlessly find it. Um, Dr. Jones lived to be 105 years old. He passed away in 2015. And at that point, in some respects, uh, the story concludes of the original team. The only person who remains at this point is Dr. Jaigo Garcia, who after concluding his stint in Norfolk, uh, moved to Hopkins and ran the IVF program at Johns Hopkins for a long time. He has since retired, but he is alive and well and living in Baltimore. In the time remaining, I will try to do some justice to the notion of the future of IVF. Here again, drawing on some of the thoughts enunciated by Dr. Howard Jones back in 2011 on the pages of Fertility and Sterility. The article in question was titled Seven Roads Traveled Well and Seven to Be Traveled More. If that reminds some of you of Robert Frost's poem, The Road Not Taken, that is not a coincidence in that Robert Frost was a teacher of Howard Jones in college. And of course, his famous poem, The Road Not Taken, was part of that mix. And on various occasions throughout his life, Dr. Jones returned to this analogy and used similar terminology in some of the speeches he's made, papers he wrote, and again, in this case, looking ahead. I created, in some respects, my own seven roads to travel more looking forward, drawing on that caption, nevertheless, and we will try in the time remaining, so as to leave enough time for questions, to go over some of the general ideas behind what the future might hold. One of the likely developments is, of course, that the IVF laboratory will become increasingly sophisticated and automated and very well could rely before too long on a so-called lab on a chip, which allows an egg to move from one area of the chip to another, be fertilized, and then the embryo moving from that point onward until it is in fact ready to be transferred. There's also likely to be growing use, although it's already in substantial use today, of course, is the use of the, what I call the troph ectoderm window. The troph ectoderm, as you know, is the outer layer of the embryo 
And it is the one tissue that lends itself to a biopsy and therefore to a cellular analysis of either the genetic elements of the embryo or other components thereof. This is now frequently used in the context of what is known as PGD um, or similar such terms. And it is likely to continue to be used in an increasingly sophisticated fashion. One could really subject that uh, tissue to extensive sequencing, extensive analysis, and potentially some prediction of future traits, which is coming into focus as we speak, so-called polygenic prediction. That is a conceptually controversial issue, which is being debated at this time. But to be sure, there already is a commercial enterprise involved in this arena, and the process is progressing. How it will end up, and precisely to what degree will this be applied, remains to be seen. It's also possible in the future that embryos who are born to parents with known genetic disease could be subjected to remedial germline editing using CRISPR-like technology. At this time, this is not permitted for the obvious reasons that the technology is just not there. More harm is being done than good. This is a separate conversation, probably a separate lecture. But the bottom line is that several influential committees of the National Academy of Medicine, of the Royal Society of Medicine, and combinations thereof, the World Health Organization as well, concluded that remedial germline editing is premature at this time. Its time has not come. Another very promising future arena is that of in vitro gametogenesis. For those of you who may be aware of it, last week saw a workshop put on by the National Academies of Medicine, which I happen to have chaired, which dealt with this truly remarkable and um, completely unexpected and revolutionary notion. The idea here is to create an egg or a sperm from a somatic cell using stem cell technology. In other words, convert, say, a skin cell using induced pluripotent stem technology gradually through multiple steps into either an egg or a sperm. What that means, of course, to IVF is that in principle, if this technology matured, matures, and if it is approved by the FDA, et cetera, it could in fact provide uh, prospective IVF patients with a source of eggs that uh, would preclude the need in gonadotropin stimulation and egg retrieval, all of which could be interpreted to mean that IVF in time could potentially become an in vitro procedure. There will be very little need, if you will, to engage the mother other than future mother, other than through embryo transfer, of course, which uh, cannot be bypassed at this time. This is not going to be here tomorrow. But it's moving fast, which is why the National Academy of Medicine chose to put on the workshop last week. 
it will definitely revolutionize reproduction as we know it and in vitro and uh, IVF and more specifically in the context we discussed. This technology most recently has been shown to in fact make it possible to convert one gamete into another specifically at this point a nature paper documented the conversion of a sperm into an egg all of which means that for example gay men in a relationship could in principle create an embryo and using a surrogate perhaps take that embryo to term and thereby establish their own family as well. As you can see, the possibilities are mushrooming and the technology is really what's behind it and which makes it all possible. Same-sex assisted reproduction, which I just mentioned, has actually been possible using other technologies that are in some respects less reliable and a little bit more futuristic. But uh, one way or the other, it seems that same-sex assisted reproduction is upon us or will be upon us before too long. One future development in reproduction, the so-called notion of ectogenesis, the idea of the embryo being carried all the way to term in a context that is artificial rather than the mother's womb, has been around for probably a hundred years. Whether or not we are anyway nearer to making this possible is a big question. Um, but efforts are ongoing, mostly, of course, in non-human models, to advance this technology, the value of which we can all, of course, debate. Using or closing, if you will, with another one of Dr. Jones's uh, statements, um, in his original paper, he was referring to what he referred to as embryos possessive of newborn potential. In other words, can we get to a point whereby we can actually identify those embryos that are likely to do well, which to say are going to implant and are going to thrive in utero all the way to term. That means also, among other things, avoiding, if at all possible, a spontaneous miscarriage. He was hoping that one fine day, we might be in a position to actually identify such embryos, select them out, and transfer those to the mother in the hope that we're going to end up with a successful pregnancy. We're not there yet, needless to say, but it's perhaps an appropriate note to conclude on to both recognize and honor the, the contributions of uh, Drs. Howard and Georgiana Jones to reproduction in general and to IVF in particular. With that, I think I'm going to conclude um, and make myself available to questions. I want to thank you for the opportunity to share with you this story, with which I was not personally involved, but because of my familiarity with the Joneses, always meant a great deal to me. And I was very pleased to have this opportunity to share this perspective with you. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I hope you all enjoyed. I heard this conference before, and I also bought the book and read the book, which goes into more detail. And I remain with a question, which is for my colleagues in the audience, they are all younger than me. 
uh, they probably think that ultrasounds were around all this time, but they were not. Uh, so my question is, how were those eggs retrieved in the case of the cars? Well, the cars had a retrieval the way it was in those days, which is laparoscopically. Uh, I neglected to mention that in the interest of time, but uh, at that point in time, um, egg retrieval involved laparoscopy. Uh, and that was the case with Judy Carr. It was only later that really an Austrian um, physician scientist introduced us to uh, transvaginal ultrasound guided retrieval of eggs, which is of course a marked improvement on general anesthesia and laparoscopy, but that was not available in 1981 and wasn't even dreamt about. And so all the 53 uh, IVF cases that I described that did not materialize, all of them involved laparoscopic egg retrieval. And once the Jones, once the NOFO clinic was off and running after the success of Judy Carr, and obviously had more patients that they had person power to deal with. Um, ne nevertheless, whoever went through that clinic at the time, and in really any other clinic in the United States, uh, which emerged very quickly thereafter, um, in Los Angeles, in uh, uh, New York, and elsewhere, uh, they all used laparoscopic retrieval until such time that uh, transvaginal sonographically guided egg retrieval became available. Maybe 86, 85. You may well be right. Uh, that's a good date to look up. Uh, I haven't done that. And I think that's, you may well be right. Okay. Anybody has any other question? Oh, there are chats there. Okay, in the, since nobody seems to have a question, um, in the well less traveled, would you put the, or the, the, the roads to travel, would you include making a IVF available to minorities? Yes, I mean, I think uh, that gets into an appropriate but whole new different arena that is perhaps almost unique probably to the United States, because you probably would not have to ask this question in uh, Europe. Yeah. yeah. And I would think you probably don't have to ask this question in uh, South America, or definitely not in Australia, where everybody is covered. And in Australia, as a result, you might be interested to know that the latest reports from Australia suggest that five out of every hundred babies born are attributable to IVF, 5%. And that is because IVF is covered by the Australian Health Service. It's, I'm a, yeah. it's a unique American issue, which is very regrettable that in vitro fertilization is not a covered service definitely not on a national basis, definitely not by Medicare and Medicaid. And in most states, with a few exceptions, uh, the situation is the same. And so, yes, 
we have we we uh, have very little to be proud of when it comes to this issue this is a stain really on our social conscience that i hope one fine day can be removed well i think the situation in in south america latin america is the same i know in india also is not covered but i was wondering about china where the chinese are trying to take leadership as we all know in the ukrainian conflict and uh, i was hearing today that argentina is going to start transactions in 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 gens instead of dollars uh, which is kind of very interesting and china has a uh, a base in uh, in patagonia and but in IVF, I doubt that they are going anywhere because they try to limit their number of births. Am I wrong? Uh, somewhat in the sense that their birth rate has actually declined. And so in the last, I would say, year or two, the missives we hear from China, and I don't know a great deal about their IVF numbers in terms of the national picture. I was in China many times. I visited many IVF programs. They are very active and very good at what they do. But I'm not sure there is a national policy. I also, and I would add, as I said, that if the issue is to increase the numbers, uh, the last few years uh, would probably have supported that notion in this because what used to be a very clear population explosion that may no longer be entirely true the practice practices are changing in china as well And a last comment, uh, in Israel, I understand the IVF is part of uh, health insurance. You get sort of free IVF. And I have a Palestinian patient uh, from Israel, a Palestinian Israeli patient who got IVF three times for free. Uh, so it's, I think it's something interesting to share too. Yeah, and I think that's true of, as, I, as we said, uh, almost every nation around the globe. Um, the U.S., once again, is a standout in terms of how it handles the funding of IVF. And as I said earlier, that's very regrettable. There's no indication that this is about to change anytime soon. Um, I wish it were otherwise, but this is a fact that you brought up and you're absolutely correct about it. And we need to be mindful of it and work towards changing it. Okay, so we are very, very, very thankful and I hope to see you again, maybe in five years, uh, for an update. <laughs> thank you. That would be fine. Okay. Thank you again. Bye-bye. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.